Good afternoon, now. Let's let's get started. Uh, welcome to another Ken seminar series. And this week uh, we are actually quite privileged to have one of our own uh, students way back many years ago to come back as a full professor to give us a great lecture today. So uh, we're really happy to have uh, Professor Zamping Yu to come back from Michigan Tech. And uh, Dr. Yu actually received his uh, PhD degree back in 2003 here with Professor Butler. And I was uh, serving on his PhD committee at that time. And uh, I think, uh, as I remembered correctly, we were just talking about that, his application to uh, using discrete element methodology uh, to actually looking at some of the asphalt concrete sections, some of the asphalt concrete specimens, like disc specimens and others, to model the behavior using the EM. The discrete element method was one of the first in that time uh, applied on, on asphalt concrete specimens. So, uh, since then, of course, he's been a professor at Michigan uh, Technological University. Uh, Zemping has over 20 years of practical and research experience with payments, engineering, and materials. He has completed research projects on a wide range of subjects, including payment, including payment design, warm mix asphalt, rubber asphalt, and bio asphalt drive biomass. He served as a PI and the director of the Center of Excellence for their Transportation Materials Center uh, in Michigan, Michigan Tech, uh, which is a partnership with Michigan DOT uh, for some years as well. So uh, over the years, we've interacted quite a bit, and I know he's doing a lot of good work, especially in this topic area of multi-scale multi modeling. Uh, still, he has a library of aggregates from his presentations and things that he's trying to come up with. Uh, all of this modeled within the asphalt concrete, uh, I guess, skeleton, and then, well, forming the asphalt micromechanics model itself. So without further ado, I will just uh, uh, welcome here Professor uh, Zamping Yu to give us a great lecture today on, on the multi-scale modeling. Zamping? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, my honor to be here and to come back to my uh, home school and to uh, talk to uh, distinguished uh, professors and researchers. And especially, I'm very honored to have a Professor T. Tumler to come here because he was not only my teacher, uh, teach my uh, the pavement design class, and also he served in my PhD uh, committee. So, of course, you have Professor O. Young here and uh, Dr. Ozer here with all the distinguished researchers here. I feel I should be really very humble uh, to talk about uh, some work I have been doing. So I'm going to talk about uh, the multi-scale modeling work uh, toward to a pavement system. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, Professor Tidumala already introduced myself. Uh, I want to really introduce myself a little bit more, uh, basically starting to where I was born. So we can see a small circle here. This is a, the China map of China over here. It's the borderline here. So I was born over here. We call it northwest of China. Really, you can see it's very toward to the east. Um, but really, because there are a lot less people living in this area, so we call it northwest here. So I lived here. And then, of course, I helped the family and I raised animals, the sheep, the, and uh, take care of the uh, crops. And, uh, you know, of course, um, you know, I live in that area, really very beautiful and in, in nature. And then, of course, I went to school uh, when I was, was uh, little. Uh, of course, the building here, you see, that's really a school building. It's the current school building, about 10 years old. And when, in my time, that was not there. <laughs> so it was really very, uh, you know, a clay type of building. So anyway, uh, I went to Xi'an, uh, which is the ancient capital of China for over 1,000 years. I studied my bachelor degree and my master's degree. You can see I had a lot of fun there. Uh, of course, I helped uh, you know, to uh, do research and help the teaching. And of course, I spent seven years there to earn my bachelor and uh, master's degrees. So of course, immediately after that, I went to Beijing, uh, the capital of China, to uh, conduct research. Uh, so it's a uh, Beijing Municipal Research Engineering Research Institute. I spent uh, about 13 months there. So then I moved to Illinois. 
that is basically my time starting. It's basically giving me a new, a completely new career and starting to um, really change a lot of things in my life. Uh, you can see on this picture here, this was when I was here, this ATRO was starting to build this type of testing um, facilities. Uh, and then, of course, I did some research work in the lab. You can see, and uh, this one really uh, in that time. And I did some uh, work uh, really uh, also in the discrete element modeling work. And uh, first time attended an uh, international conference when I was over here with a f almost a fresh student. And then I took the uh, bus like two days to, uh, to uh, West Virginia to attend a conference. This was a fir my very first presentation overseas. Um, so, uh, of course, later on, of course, you know, in December, you can see with the snow, I graduated. That's, um, uh, I was really very happy to see that one. Today, you can see, basically, you cannot really see. If you stand over here, you cannot really see this building, right? Be Beckman Institute. You could not really see because right now, it's a lot of leaves are growing. And after so many years, the trees are grew bigger and bigger. And of course, if, after my graduation, I went to Texas. This is my first job. Um, as assistant professor at Texas A&M University in Kingsville, I did some kind of fun research, and of course, my mainly my major job is really teaching. This is a teaching serving class. I teach. I, I also uh, help with the um, transportation engineering class, and uh, sometimes uh, geo a geo engineering. No, sorry, a geotechnical engineering, and also uh, uh, civil engineering materials class. So with that, of course, some research work. For example, this is modeling work. Uh, this is some of the used recycled them. Uh, well, tire tires, recycled waste tires uh, along the, the uh, Mexico and uh, Texas borderline. We get a lot of those kind of tires and build it so that we can use this one to build a, the subgrade of roads. Um, this one is, of course, 250 tires to support this giant vehicle to pass through the local roads. We have to build this kind of thick wood boards in order to. Uh, avoid any damage to the local roads, culverts, bridges. Some kind of fun things I did there. Of course, later on, I moved my career to up to the north, read really way north. So basically, north there. So basically, in Michigan Tech, and of course, I learned how to stand in the steel, uh, stand still in the snow and on ice. Um, of course, and then I have a lot of fun. So basically, it was fun. I did some research work on, on continue my career in micromechanics models, and of course. Uh, recent years, I also do a lot of the work on the field. So basically, um, and this one is basically some rubber modified asphalt pavement demonstration projects. And we did uh, uh, projects, uh, projects in uh, Kiwana County, in Upper Peninsula, and also in Muskegon County in um, uh, lower uh, part of Michigan. This is a part of the campus here at Michigan Tech. This is uh, my, uh, my office is about over here, this area. Um, but you can see. It's, we have a lot of water body uh, in the area, uh, especially if you take a look at this picture here. This is a big Lake of Superior. We are over here uh, on the end of the, 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 you know, the far end of the, uh, uh, the Upper Peninsula. And uh, you can see we are not really connected with Michigan. I was talking to Dr. Ozer yesterday. We are not really connected with Michigan here. Only there's a bridge, of course. It's a bridge and it connects to, to uh, Michigan. And we are closer to Wisconsin, as you can see. I drive from here to Green Bay, and then I can drive to Chicago. Of course, uh, uh, about four hours away, well, the radius, any radius about four hours, really, you can, there's no expressway. So anywhere, if I drive to Green Bay, you can find an expressway. Over here, I have to pass the bridge. So therefore, the transportation is a little bit limited, but it's very fun. You can see in return, you have the weather like this almost every day. Of course, not every day, in the fall semester. Uh, so this is basically a new picture I just took before I leave. I just took a picture. Uh, this is a part of a US 41. And a picture like this. So basically, we have a, really, a lot of really beautiful uh, sites, uh, national parks, and uh, state parks. There are a lot of um, places really beautiful. They are not in the park system, but they are beautiful. So my research work really is touched based about uh, sustainable pavements. And in order to do that, of course, some of my work really is directly about the materials. For example, uh, bioasphalt binders. This type of materials, it really is derived uh, the, um, asphalt binder or derived the bio oil from mass, maybe from yard waste, from uh, trees, from uh, swine waste, or maybe from soybeans, or from some, any of uh, those uh, switch grasses. 
And this is part of work. The other part of work I do is tire rubber uh, modified asphalt. That is, um, is a one topic that really has been studied so many years, and we are continuing to improve it, to improve the properties of the materials so that it can serve the transportation need. So warm mix asphalt is also one topic, really. We have been starting pretty early. Um, so uh, one of the first uh, warm mix projects in the country was built in Michigan. Um, and I always played something about nano materials modified asphalt and uh, recycled materials like re uh, recycled asphalt shingles and recycled asphalt pavements. So with that, of course, uh, we also you know, take a look at the life cycle uh, aspect of uh, pavement and the materials as well as pavement design. So in pavement design, and we did some work, for example, for Michigan Department of Transportation to help their mechanical empirical design. And um, so with that aspect, of course, in the detailed um, uh, research work we are doing basically to support those ideas are really one thing is about uh, multi-skill modeling, uh, which we use the four type of um, uh, technologies to support the multi-skill modeling. And then, of course, we also have some smaller scale study about the chemo physical analysis. So we are going to really sample a little bit of the work from chemo physical analysis and uh, talk about the multi-skill modeling work. So this is basically a very brief introduction about some work I've been doing in the past uh, decade. So the first one, let's take a look at the multi-skill modeling. The first piece of work I'd like to take a look is uh, image-based models. Image-based models, basically, uh, this type of idea is originally, uh, is you can see it's a, a little bit earlier. So uh, there, I get some ideas when I study my PhD here. Um, so back in 2000, well, 1999 to 2003. So some of the ideas, for example, this one is the original image. This type of image right now is really easy to obtain. So in the past, we don't have a smartphone to take images. Right now, everybody almost have a smartphone. You can take a smartphone, you can take an image of any sample, and or use your scanner, or use your photos, uh, photographs. You can get this kind of image easily. Then you do a certain field of a uh, certain of image processing technique. So basically, for example, you process the image, and then you separate all the, the uh, dark uh, from the white. So basically, you, you, you separate them, um, you find out the aggregates and uh, mastic. So basically, you find those separation, and then, of course, with that, you can build a model. But with, uh, for example, you can build a finite element model or a discrete element model. For this case here is a discrete element model's image here. So this is uh, some work, earlier work we are doing. So basically, this is called image-based, because first we need image, then we get the model. So with that, of course, we, are, we as I just mentioned, we have image, we can process it, we can make a finite element models. You can see all the red, all these red colors, these are the finite element models for the aggregates. And of course, for the mastic, with black color. So this is um, uh, some of the image-based models. And um, since our, with the, our understanding of materials going further, so basically we are not really satisfied with two-dimensional models anymore. So we really want to expand our knowledge to three dimensions. For example, here is basically an image from X-ray computer tomography. So with this, of course, we can view this sample. Maybe this sample is about 150 millimeter tall, six inch tall. Or, so then basically with each, centimeter, each millimeter, for example, can take a cut. Well, we really use X-ray tomography to cut. So basically, we get a lot of slices of images. So for example, this sample, now we can easily get 150 slices. Or you can uh, change your resolution, get more or less. So with that, of course, we get those, these images. And for each of these image, we can do a certain of analysis. For example, we can pick one, sample, one image here. We can separate this image. Um, we can separate this image to three different things, three different phases. One is aggregates in the black color here, and all two, mastic, and the three is air void. So basically, we can easily separate those to the three faces we are, we are looking for. So this is basically the first, um, we get the uh, uh, X3 uh, computer tomography image, and then we process it so that we can get the three different faces. And then for each of the faces, Basically, we can easily do, uh, do uh, discrete element models or finite element models. For the work I've shown you here, is discrete element models. This is two-dimensional models. This is something we have discussed very previously. And then we can compact all the things together. So how we compact those two-dimensional models together? 
almost you have a bunch of cards. Now you have a bunch of cards. This one is the one dimension model, well, two dimension models. This is also one dimension model, two dimension models, sorry. So if I put all the things together back to back, now you have three dimension models. In order to understand one piece, what is the other one? So basically we have a certain bonds between that. For example, we have adhesive bond or cohesive bond. So that glue things together, so now you have three dimensional models. So this is, is one idea. So this is how we really generate a three dimensional models. So here is basically, here's more exact what we are doing here. You can see we get the X3 computed tomography images and then we process it, we can get the aggregate. We can of course, we can sort any type of aggregate we want. We can according to the size, for example, this is 1.18 millimeter, 0.6 millimeter, or 0.3 millimeter. We can sort that, we can uh, find anything we want. And then we can build a model, this right now is three dimensional models. On the red color is the aggregate, aggregate, the yellow is mastic, and over here basically I show you all the, the structure of the air voids. So basically this is how we read from the image of the X3 tomography data, um, and then back to the uh, discrete element models. So that is one approach we are doing. So in order to, for, to understand this uh, type of image a little better, as I just introduced earlier on, with this 150 slices of image, of course we can make the resolution differently. So, and then we can ca calculate the air voids. For example, the air voids here, probably about 25%. And then going you know, over here, maybe it's about 10%. And over here, maybe about 3%. 3%, maybe here is 20%. So basically, along the depth, the distribution of air voids is different. What we do in the lab, of course, is get the average of the air void level. We say, okay, this is 4% or 7%. In reality, it's not exactly 4% or 4%. It's not, it's just um, on the average side. So basically, this I want to really just show you what is um, air void distribution along the depth. So of course, use that way, we can just uh, get the, get the uh, models for each layers, of course, we really represent the true um, as for the mixtures uh, size and also the, the air void distribution. So basically what all I talked here is basically part one, so about image-based models. So my next uh, small topic is the user-defined models. The user-defined, so basically that really means we have to define something. So here is I want to really briefly show how I really define uh, these type of models. Of course, my target here is not really uh, satisfied with discrete element models. What I'm trying to expand some of the work to, uh, to finite element models. For example, let's take a look at first, so I would prepare aggregates and air voids in discrete element models first. So basically, I can easily use computers as computer to generate aggregates and air voids for me. Here's some uh, how, we, how the work really been done. So basically, on this animation, uh, we can uh, generate aggregates from, for different sizes. This is, for example, some of the samples of, of the models we have. And then with that, of course, also air voids basically completes everything in this container, and then we can just uh, get one image, this image or this sample. Okay? So when we get the samples ready, when we get the samples ready, basically it's really just the container, aggregates, air voids. So basically the different part, parts. So then we can do a lot of things on it. We can, for example, can set stiffness or boundary conditions and uh, to let it do any simulation. We can analyze any particle's movement, orientations or positions. We can basically know all those parameters if we really have interest. So this is the part of the study we have. So in details, we have two process later on to build, a, if we wanted to build a three d dimensional of finite element models, there are two approaches. One I call the virtual scanning, the other called just to create input file directly. So for the first one, let's take a look at how I really do that um, through, through this animation here. So first one is basically virtually scanned. So first, of course, you can remember, we just did earlier on was to prepare the images, really the samples first, these aggregates and air void samples. And then with that, we can virtually cut many slices, like just like simulate X3 computer tomography. We cut it to many slices. You pick any slice here, you get aggregates, air voids, 
asphalt mastic, and so on. So of course, with each of this, then we have mature calculations work being done, as I showed you earlier. So of course, read with this, you get a lot of two-dimensional images, and you stack all those images together, you make three-dimensional solids, and they easily make 3D finite element models. Okay, so that is basically the process we are doing for the first uh, uh, type of approach. So we call, I call it virtual scanning. So the second one is basically creating the input file directly. So how do we really do that? So basically I'm going to show you here is, this is called approach number two. So, so first of course we need to write some of the, the code. For example, for my example, we're going to have similarly, we can generate this kind of uh, models first use computer very, diff very easily. Then we cut a slice out of that. Now this slice become a colored groups and basically including a lot of aggregates, air voids. And uh, so with that, we can write down, the computer will give me all the codes out. So basically where is the elements? Where is a different type of things? So then basically I can combine all those layers to the abacus. My example here is abacus, of course, there's no reason we cannot really use that for something else. So basically, I can ask my discrete element models to write abacus input code. So that is basically one thing. We can make the process uh, really straightforward and so that we can uh, get those things done. So this is basically our so-called user-defined finite element my model. I want to really take a quick look. For example, there are, these are basically some of the uh, uh, aggregates I have been I have generated, and um, also uh, for the um, you, you can see here is there are some aggregates here. Of course, here is basically the air voids. Uh, so basically, eventually the aggregate the aggregate and air voids uh, structure we used for those sample examples we're just showing here. So basically, that is really how we really accomplish uh, those. So basically, this is. The image here really included in aggregates and air already. And of course, when we cut it, I just uh, rephrase some of the work we just did earlier on. We cut it slice, you know, virtually and basically get those images. And then basically we can get the aggregate mastic and the air voids and so on. And of course, then of course, for the similar lay, we can stack all the images together. Right now, this is three dimensional image with all the aggregates, uh, orientation, all the size. And of course, we can do some meshing work to make uh, the, uh, uh, for example, this one example is uh, tetrahedral elements um, uh, we're using uh, in finite element. And of course, here is basically, I want to really show some more about the three-dimensional structure of air voids. If these air voids are in the model, of course, in the actual calculation, those things will be removed from the calculation because those are just uh, voids. And um, in, the, in, the, in the discussion we just mentioned, in the finite element models, so basically uh, we just need to write down those type of parameters, for example, where the, uh, which one of the aggregates is aggregate one, for example, where are the coordinates of those, and uh, where are the elements, so basically with all those input files are really being generated through our, our discrete element uh, output. So basically they will output all those things uh, directly from the system. And here's another example, for example, showing you where is the node with aggregates, um, and where are the nodes, there are the coordinates, x, y, and z. Uh, so basically, they give you all the elements. So basically, that is uh, um, what is the model really look like. Here, for example, the, the aggregates uh, in, green in green color. The green is basically asphalt mastic, red air voids. So uh, that is basically, of course, on the very right-hand side here is aggregate models, only pure aggregates. Um, looks like they are very dense, they are connected together, sometimes they are not really. Um, I also really want to show you uh, some work, for example, is um, this one is finite element models for the asphaltic. This is for the air voids, and uh, here is basically when we have a cut uh, from the vertically, uh, you can see what the structure looks like inside. So basically, so far we talked about the user-defined models, so basically we, we threw uh, some of the definition in our program. We can make the computer basically generate some of the input code for us for finite element models. So basically, use that way, we can easily create a lot of interesting uh, models uh, 
through discrete LMM models. So in that way, also, we have a, a goal is to uh, integrate both benefits of a discrete element and a finite element together. So the third thing i like to discuss is aggregate model library building. So really, how are we really going to build this library? Um, so the objective, of course, is one, we want to really generate the library, and um, we want to use some user-defined aggregates, or we use the real aggregates. And uh, then uh, the two, basically, will be, uh, eventually, we want this library to be used uh, for larger models so that we don't really have to go to look for aggregates. So basically, we can randomly pick or whatever, unpurposely pick from the whole library, and then basically for the possible use by other people. So this is basically our, uh, our goal. And uh, as an example, I just showed a little early on. So basically, we can define some aggregates like this. Of course, this is, um, uh, we have certain algorithm to write those things. Uh, the other approach basically is going to do is real aggregates. According to some real aggregates, for example, I go to stop how I collect uh, thousands of aggregates, and then basically I can do, uh, I can find out the outlines of aggregate particles, shapes, and then basically uh, and use that one basically to fill in the inside space um, so that we can really uh, get the aggregates. So this is, of course, it's um, a little bit of um, uh, uh, sounds like really very tedious approach, but once we get the first things done, so basically first um, uh, aggregate done, you find out actually the work is not really, uh, really very tedious. For example, here is um, I picked the four aggregates here. And these four aggregates are really come from our stop house. I just picked them, and then basically I, I, I of course I let the, uh, this aggregate really go through different things. Really, one thing is through actually computed tomography. Basically, I get all the outlines, all the structures. And then, of course, my goal that was that. Basically, get the outlines. Okay. So basically, what we do is um, we find out the outlines. We basically use a lot of tiny, tiny balls to basically pack outside the, the surface of the, of the sample. And then, basically, we get um, really right now, this is basically the outline shape, what this looks like. Of course, we can do is the ball size, for example, we can use one millimeter or tenth of a millimeter, or even smaller if, you, if we really don't worry about the computation. So this is basically the example how we really get the outlines. When we get the outlines, we write some kind of a computer algorithm. So with the algorithm, basically we build one called a tree algorithm. So basically we have a tree, uh, the branches grow the tree, and on the tree we have a primary branch. On the primary branch, we can let it um, have a secondary branch, like a blue color here. So what that really means, on the, main on the, br uh, on the primary branch, we can let the, the directions have uh, 26 different directions to grow a lot of the different uh, balls. And let it grow. And then on the branch itself, we can just also let it has eight directions in the secondary growth. So there are some reasons behind it. So basically, um, we can. Uh, we can grow basically like this outline here. We can easily fill it up with a lot of balls in different sizes. For example, I want to really give an example here. For example, here right now the primary direction is going to fill up the balls, and then because that's with a lot of directions, so it's easily filled up the space. And then the secondary direction is going to move on. So basically, a lot of the space will be be occupied it, like over here. Now, it's, now I think the calculation is done. So basically, right now we have we filled up the entire surface of the balls, of these outlines. So right now, so basically, with the entire aggregates really be fully occupied with different balls. So now the aggregates is ready. So with that, of course, we can see this is basically the outline surface of the aggregates. Now here is basically we filled up with all the balls with the surface. And then we just get rid of all those surface because surface balls are just for our reference. So those are not really should be there. We, take, we get rid of those. Now we get rid of the real aggregates. What does that so really look like? So of course, what we can do is make this one really very, uh, try to make the aggregates as real as possible by changing the resolution. Um, but even for this big resolution for this, we can uh, occupy uh, a lot of the space really for the aggregates. For example, we can easily make that 95, 91% of the space, which is, um, uh, and this computation is really fast. 
So of course, the other thing we can do is to em eliminate some of the possible duplicate aggregates, or well, not, not the aggregates, basically the bars in the aggregates. So basically, for example, we can reduce that one by quite a bit, so maybe five times less. So basically, this one was 1328, so right now we have 286 uh, bars inside. So this, of course, is going to improve the computation uh, time. And with that, of course, we can do easily is going to, because 286 bars, which will take some space for store. So how we really uh, take a look at the storage is going to be uh, something we have to really consider, because eventually we are going to play big data, a lot of data. So we have a radius of all the bars, ball one, two, three, four, and then we also with the positions x, y, and z, okay, for each boss. So therefore, the, the positions, radius, everything really has to be considered in this approach. Of course, we can uh, have some samples of work. Of course, with the refining, you can see these are some of the, the aggregates we generated. And uh, of course, with the resolution going on, of course, you can make that more and more um, accurate. So this is basically some of the library we have. And with this type of library, basically, we can do a lot of things. We can basically um, do some of the compaction simulation, for example. Uh, here, you can see this is basically loose compact samples. We don't really you know, compress too hard. And then after that, of course, we do some of really uh, com uh, trying to compress it. So basically, compact it. You can see this is dense compacted now. So this one, of course, less air voice. And of course, you can see from the uh, top view or from side view, you see what's there the position change for different uh, um, aggregates. So this is one way, of course, for us to look at uh, how we really are using the existing library to understand the uh, uh, structure we have interest. So, so far we discussed uh, the top three things uh, in our uh, multi-scale modeling work. Uh, the last thing really I'd like to take a look is, is numerical modeling simulations. So with this simulation, this slide here really was done in about 2002 or 2003 when I was here. So I, I wanted to really show this up again because there are interesting things. I crushed a lot of these kind of egg, this samples over here in this building. I crushed a lot. I could not remember how many. but uh, uh, And then, you know, of course, gave me a feeling, okay, so how can I really simulate those things through computer? So basically, I generated two models. And then, you know, I, of course, these are not matching very well. They are not really the same samples anyway. So basically, I made that. Now, from here, you can see something. You can see one crack is vertically open. One is basically almost like a little bit um, randomly, per se, right? Because the samples, the loading was really from here, and here basically supported, OK? So the two models, actually, these are exactly the same if you really take a look. The only thing, I just use different colors. Now, this one is homogeneous material. This one is heterogeneous. Homogeneous material basically means all the aggregates and asphalt portion, their bonds, strands are the same. That's homogeneous. Now, this one is different. So basically, the aggregates, this aggregate is red aggregate. Yellow here is mastic or asphalt. Basically, they're, the bond strands, they are weaker. So therefore, during the loading, you can see the bond strands really break first. Basically, those pieces are separate first. And then, of course, eventually, lead the entire sample fail. And also, even it's, uh, because the load is too high, eventually the strength really of the aggregates even cannot really resist the, the crack going on. The aggregates really get cracked. So this is something uh, we, we did, I think, uh, um, many years ago. But I still think this is something uh, interesting to show here. Um, we also uh, did some work on the uh, beam fracture simulation. For example, here is a uh, uh, is um, some beam we have done in our lab, and this is something we are trying to study the self-heating asphalt materials. Okay, self-heating. We are trying to make the self-heating happen. Of course, we did was did some lab work. Right now, we are trying to do the simulation. For example, we just um, if there's a notch here. There's a notch on the sample notch here. So basically, we can load it. So basically, through this process, really we want to see how the crack propagate, and. Um, uh, here, here's one example how really the, the uh, crack of propagation. And there are some air voids here. This is just a very simplified um, um, simplified uh, um, model here so that you know, we can see it clearly. I think because the resolution 
issues. You cannot really see very, very well, but you can see basically the crack propagation on this on the sample here. And uh, there are quite a bit of uh, dynamic moving. So basically right now, of course, the sample is break. Right? This is basically the failure, the end of the failure. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is the application is, is quite, uh, quite wide. We can really do a lot of different uh, applications of that. So the one type of application I've been doing is called dynamic modular simulation. Of course, we do a lot of lab work. We do a lot. We do a lot of writing tests. We do a lot of those really fun tests. What I want to do is see how in the computer we can do those things. Here's one sample course. This is in the lab. How really we do the test. We apply load on it. We apply, for example, sinusoidal load on it. We want to find out the string response. Okay. We find out the string response. So in that way, we can calculate what is dynamic modulus, what is the facing angle, what is other basically elastic properties. So this is basically here saying this is asphalt mixtures, um, um, discrete element models. And here, of course, associated uh, the air voids. Of course, air voids are not participating in the calculation because air voids are voids. So basically, this is the sample. Okay, after the, in the model, of course, we apply different boundary conditions. We give them parameters of the materials. We give aggregates, mastic properties, and then do the similar boundary condition. So basically, we can test the sample. And of course, uh, inside, we also need to be really careful about the, the adhesion and cohesion. The adhesion and cohesion are all very important. So basically, it's part of the calculation. So these parameters, of course, also be critical uh, to be used. So with that, uh, of course, with those uh, uh, parameters in, in involved, so basically, we can do a stress stream. We can cut any length of the calculation. For example, here is this is what the stress we input, and then we get the restraint response. Okay. So with that, of course, from this curve, we can do we can calculate um, the dynamic modulus. We can calculate the phase angle, and so that we can understand the viscoelastic properties of this entire sample. So of course, the base was we understand the ingredient properties. Now we really want to understand what is um, the final composites material properties. So this is basically shown to us how really we get from there that standpoint. And one thing I want to really show here is, is basically we did um, three-dimensional of model work and also two-dimensional model work. For the two-dimensional work, of course, it's kind of easy to do, easy to, to conduct. That's something I personally like. Because calculation is short, it's really straightforward. So with that, of course, you can see all these uh, 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 a square dots here basically are from, uh, uh, from the two-dimensional models. You can see mixture testing the lab. Uh, versus the mixture modulus predicted. Yeah, you can see actually they are not really very bad. Uh, but if I really use a three-dimensional model, you can see it's much closer to so basically matching with the laboratory data. So that is one way because we think okay, a lot of times three-dimensional models still give us really a lot of the uh, useful information we are really missing. So therefore, of course, that's the reason a lot of times right now we prefer using three-dimensional models than two-dimensional models. Of course, nothing wrong with two-dimensional models. That's just the, how we really understand it. So we also really trying to, pre to uh, do something really, um, you know, students like to do this type of things. They want to see something really fun. I say, OK, let's, let's just do it. So basically, wheel pavement interactions, how we really can do that. So basically, we can just, all of these things are balls. You can see all the balls are glued together. So basically, we're trying to simulate what the, really the real wheels look like, tires, anyway. Uh, so basically, we have concentrated force on it. We have torsion moments really come from the motor. So basically, with that, of course, we can cap, we can do some of, of the uh, simulation on that. And uh, the other type of things I just remembered, uh, we did some uh, asphalt paving paver analyzer. Uh, so basically, the AP test we can get generate running in the lab, and then basically what we're trying to see, okay, how can we redo that in the on the computer? So basically, we can generate um, the now uh, that uh, is pretty uh, interesting thing. We can generate in the sample like uh, you know, cylindric samples or like uh, slab samples. Trying to simulate what really happened in the lab. And of course, our next goal, of course, we're trying to expand some work really to the field. So basically, if, if our computing really can, is, a, is a power, powerful enough, that I think there's no uh, problem to calculate something. So 
So far, basically, I have really briefly introduced some work about the multi-skill modeling we have been doing. And I think we probably uh, have a little bit of time to talk about the chemical physical analysis. I have a few slides here trying to share with you some information we have been doing. And um, so basically, one type of work is a molecular dynamics simulation. So basically, uh, through here, we can see some of the uh, something that we, we have been doing in recent years. So one thing, basically, in the asphalt structure, we know asphalt is a basically composite, it's a blend of different uh, of, uh, materials. OK, so basically, it's kind of difficult to find out what are really the, the molecules inside. What are the molecules? So basically, there are a lot of different molecules. There are thousands there. So basically, what we're trying to do is separate those things to three parts. One is saturate, one aromatic, one asphaltene. And asphaltene, which is, uh, is the largest of the molecules, basically, it's uh, heavy weighted. And of course, uh, so basically with that, of course, we have each one, we find one very common molecules. So for example, for this one, saturate, we, we find one common one. Uh, aromatic, we find one. And uh, of course, for asphaltene, also same thing. Uh, for asphaltene, if you take a closer look, there is one sulfur here. There is a carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen. There's occasionally there are sulfur here. So basically, for each of those uh, uh, molecules, basically we have um, we have certain of um, of the uh, uh, atoms there. So with that, of course, we can see we just make a, a really small model. The small how small it is. Seventy three molecules. Seventy three molecules of that. Um, we have five for asphaltene. We have twenty seven for aromatic. We have 41 saturates. So basically, those are the models. And um, of course, each one, we have a certain of formulas. The formula, for example, for the asphaltene, each asphaltene um, molecules, we have two sulfurs. And of course, the rest are carbon and hydrogen. So with that, eventually, we basically, our asphalt model is about this. Okay, here is the asphalt model. Of course, if you, this is not necessary to be the true representative of asphalt, but it's pretty. Uh, give us a pretty uh, good confidence. Um, so this is basically the detailed uh, structure about the asphalt models. And with that, of course, we can do some uh, simulation here. As I just mentioned, we have only uh, five uh, asphaltene uh, molecules. So with that, of course, we have all the three things, three different uh, molecules inside. And uh, so basically, this one is initial stage. Initial stage, basically, uh, the, uh, the molecules basically they are around everywhere. They are not really togethering. So, so basically you can see the, the green color is basically um, carbon, hydrogen, and yellow one, as we mentioned, this is sulfur. So basically with all those uh, molecules together, we are going to right now, it's going to compress it in a box. So assume it's a box. We compress it so that you can see how much we can compress. So as we know, asphalt, we have um, about the, the density, about one grams per cubic centimeter. That's basically the rough number we are, we are getting in our mind. Now, what we are trying to do, of course, when we compress it, then what is the um, density look like? So the density we are trying to get, of course, initially it was 0 0.1 grams per cubic centimeter, which is only tenth, right? Or tenth of the actual density. So basically, with the time going on, with the compression going on, you can see, basically, eventually, we are reaching about 0.9 of, of the density, which of course not really one yet. However, we realize that we only use a very few number of molecules trying to simulate the true asphalt, which is we already get some kind of a, um, progress. So basically what we can also do with the computer, we can also extend the temperature range. A lot of times we cannot really test the samples in really high temperature or really low temperature. It is very challenging for us. So basically, we can extend those temperatures with computers, because computer does not know how cold it is. So that is basically one thing about the density. The other type of simulation we're trying to do about the, um, of course, this is part of the density simulation I really want to share with, with you. So for example, in the compression, so the other molecules are moving really fast. Uh, and then eventually, they are reaching a certain of uh, equilibrium. So with that, of course, right now is probably the end of the simulation. So basically, you can see the sulfur. I like to see the yellow ones. Um, so this, at the end, of course, this is a pretty dense already, 0 0.9, about 0 0.9, 0 0.91, 0 0.92 type of density. 
it's, it's pretty good. Um, but um, uh, what we are trying to do is to improve our models by introducing a little more complicated molecules so that uh, we can uh, have them a little bit closer to the actual sample. The other type of um, simulation we're doing is about viscosity. Of course, this type of viscosity is a little bit different than the viscosity we are testing in our lab, like rotational viscometers. Um, anyway, with this, of course, we can also see, so basically about the, because all the molecules are vibrating really fast, so basically we can have a way really to calculate what is um, um, viscosity look like. So I'm right, not really trying to really do too much of that part of work, but um, that is basically, um, there's one part of work I think is not here, okay. It's, uh, it's about the um, second part of work, it's about the nanomaterials we are playing. Um, of course, I have been really think about doing nanomaterials for um, all the things I would hear because there was uh, really quite some kind of hot topic about nanomaterials. It's so, it's, uh, it's uh, beyond our mind, I was not really sure what I can do. So basically, when I uh, joined the Michigan Tech, I was uh, trying to study, okay, how really we can do nano stuff. We can try to uh, use the advantages of uh, a nano technology. So one thing, of course, I did was nano silica, and the other is a certain of nano clay. So with those two materials, we can easily somehow introduce to aspen matrix. Introduced to aspen matrix, of course, one of the challenges is how we know if the nanomaterials can be distributed very well into the matrix because asphalt is, um, is not really uh, easy materials to work with those really, really very fine powders. So of course, eventually, we have some ways we can uh, introduce those things inside. You can see those nanomaterials that are distributed in asphalt pretty well. You can see this one also similarly. So basically, we have some ways we can make it work. And uh, we also tested uh, nanomaterials modified asphalt mixtures. Here is basically, this image has come from the asphalt mixtures um, AP, uh, AP test results. This is basically asphalt paving, uh, paper analyzer. Uh, so basically this one is uh, um, it's about the rotting of the samples. Rotting of samples, this is the samples about, so basically we have um, uh, introduced the 2% of nanomaterials or 5% of nanomaterials inside of the binder, of course, not the entire mixture. Otherwise, we are gonna have tons of um, nanomaterials needed, right? So we have a little bit. So with that, of course, you can see the contribution about the nanomaterial is pretty significant. According to the results we can get here, for example, we run 8,000 cycles of loads here. This is the control asphalt binder, uh, mixture, sorry, the mixtures. You can see you can generate about five or six, maybe a millimeter rotting, but um, for the 2% of nanomaterials here, you really only have about three. So almost reduce a half of the rotting. Of course, you get a little more, you can see there are basically a further reduced amount of rot. So basically this is some work we are, we are uh, trying to um, um, give, a, give a try about the nanomaterials application and as for the mixtures. Some other work uh, I have been doing was something like a biomass uh, to bioasphalt. So of course basically introduce bio oil uh, from uh, different biomass is um, it has been really been trying uh, through the nation. I know Illinois here we have doing uh, quite a significant amount of research using algae or some other like plastics to uh, generate bio oil. So this is some work we're doing because in Michigan, uh, as you see in the map, we don't have many people living there. We have a lot of trees. We have a lot of waste trees, waste wood. So we're trying to get, reuse it. For example, this is my students are trying to get the big giant amount of those kind of sawdust and all the wood chips trying to uh, use that uh, for our research. I'm not really showing much about the results here. So basically that is, um, is uh, some of the work we have been doing. And um, uh, some of my uh, research team members. Uh, so basically I really encourage all my students really work hard and I also have fun. So of course they work hard and uh, most of them, I will say right now really, all my graduate PhD students they are faculty somewhere. Uh, so basically they like to be a faculty. Uh, because I always encourage them to go for faculty because, uh, because they like to be faculty. They like to be um, uh, to, do, to do teaching and doing research. So I think that's really um, one thing really making me uh, very happy to work with my students. And of course, um, uh, you know, also really, I really uh, acknowledge uh, National Science Foundation's uh, support uh, through different ways, uh, through um, 
uh, here listed a few projects and also uh, quite some um, uh, collaborators and uh, ag fund agencies uh, to support the work. And of, of course, over the years, I have been, um, uh, been supported by um, my um, Illinois professors, especially like Professor Tumuller has been helped me really strongly in the past uh, decade. So basically, every time when I think about what I've been doing, I really always feel really thankful about the uh, university, about the department, and all about all the professors here. So um, I said, you know, once I was a student, and uh, I still like to be a student here. So I like to be a student today, and also in the future. So thank you very much. I think this is a very interesting question, and also, of course, a very difficult question. I should acknowledge that. First, if you think aging is a time factor, then the things will be easier, right? Because you can always, because all the calculation we input here is also is a factor of time. For example, if you know the acid mixture is going to be aging, so basically in the parameter input ahead of time, you can consider those aging effects. If they are aging by, for example, the stiffness is going to increase, OK, you just write the equation saying they are increasing. Right? That's basically easy to do. Now, the difficult thing is how about the UV aging, temperature aging? Those are going to be a little challenging. I, right now, from the top of my head, I don't have a good solution yet. But I'll be happy to discuss with you further. I think there might be some ways you can do that. For example, maybe, maybe you say, OK, well, you know, because the weather today, you know, you are going to have some kind of UV light. So basically, when you have UV light exp uh, exposure, then basically the sample need to be aged by whatever amount. Okay, I think that is it might be possible. So that is uh, I think those things maybe be planted into the code. But good, very good question. That's another a million dollar question. A million dollar question, as I said. Um, yes, uh, for the for the in the lab work, you can see it's very easy for us to simulate anything about really those um, um, rotting. Okay, large deformation. It's really easy to measure and easy to uh, to to understand. So according to about the crack, it's a little bit tough to to measure. Of course, we have uh, uh, some DCT facilities to measure. We can test the fracture energy. We can maybe measure uh, the, the acid binders uh, crack temperature. I just mentioned to um, Dr. Ozar, I have an acid binder cracking device, ABCD. We can test at what temperature uh, asphalt will crack. So it's a little bit of a challenge to uh, really to compromise. Uh, you have really good rotting resistance and also very good of a low temperature resistance. Um, so that is, of course, it's still doable. And, but there are some kind of challenges with that. Uh, well, I enjoyed your aggregate library and other things with the micro models that, you know, uh, discrete element, finite element combination you mentioned that show 2D, 3D, all of those. Especially 3D, uh, you know, those spheres you clump together yeah. to create your aggregate shape and library. I heard that uh, there is a polyhedron based. Approach is coming true at Itesca now. Have you have you heard about it or done anything with that? Yeah, because you know our most of our aggregates are Christ stone, right. and they have the angular shapes. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, very, very, very good question, uh, Professor Tumler. I think um, I know you have been doing some really nice work about um, aggregates. Basically, I think the aggregate you generated was really, really beautiful with different shapes, with nice fracture surface. I think really are beautiful. 
I know one program, of course, the program we are doing uh, since I was studying here. So basically, we are get used to a program called Particle Flow Code developed by Itasca in Minneapolis. So I think we are relying on that one because we understand the theory very well. Really think that is, uh, is one thing uh, really good to be applied in our research. And the, the aggregates you mentioned, uh, is, um, uh, there's one program called a ADAM. Uh, I think it's developed by in the UK. Uh, they are pretty useful. Uh, basically, study things like um, aggregate flow. If you have a stockpile of aggregate, you're really trying to load it somewhere. So basically, uh, the entire process you can see really well. Um, we have, I have been trying that one very briefly, but really have not really uh, do much work uh, with that. So I know the simulation with that kind of um, um, way is pretty useful. If you are, for example, uh, have um, as a plant, in as a plant, how it really kind of simulates the blending process, which is fully dynamic, is really useful. Uh, but for the, really, if you want to confine all the different aggregates together and do some loading, uh, things like what we are doing, I have not really seen much work being done yet. So. Well, uh, actually, I heard that, I, I okay, again, coming up with the BFC with just the polyhedron elements, yeah. instead okay. of square, it, you know, you don't have to actually clump many spheres like that to create a particle. You can have one element that is one particle, which is what we've been doing with Blocks 3D, uh, which is Professor Gabusi's original code that Hashash have been working, right? That's a different one, again, polyhedron. But Itasca is already coming up with a similar polyhedron-based elements, I, I, I I was wondering if I have, heard anything on that? Or yeah, not? I have not noticed that, uh, because the current and most newer version is, um, is PFC 5.0. In 5.0, there's not that function yet. Maybe they are developed that one on the back. It's not really being released. It's not released yet, maybe. Yeah, there right, maybe it's not released. I think if that is really being released, there will be really a lot of interest on that. Of course, I also hope, for example, their aggregates can also be breakable. For example, a lot of times, um, those aggregates, once they are formed, they are one aggregate. They are never being breakable, you know, it's, unless there are some special things inside. The aggregate, we are gluing things together because we can control all the adhesions there. So we, if we want to break, it will break because there are some kind of mechanics reason there. But uh, this is something I maybe I should check with Tasca to see if they are doing something like that. It's kind of interesting. Well, if there are no questions, of course, I always welcome everybody to uh, have a chance, of course, always visit Michigan Tech. We are beautiful in summertime and also wintertime. A fall semester is beautiful, as you can see the leaves. And the wintertime, a lot of snow. You can uh, do uh, you know, ice fishing. You can do skiing. At uh, university, you maintain the, I don't know, maybe 50 miles of uh, trails. Uh, it's really, really nice to visit. And uh, with that, of course, I invite uh, everybody in this room to uh, visit us. Winter is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I buy that. <laughs> yeah, well, they have a special shelter. They move you to the middle of the lake. All right, now this is your shelter. You can just, you know, ice fish here. So it's not really very windy. You stay inside. Yeah, maybe you can have your laptop there too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>